Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today for the second day of the series. So before we go ahead, let's look at some of the verses once again. Or let's look at some of the themes that we discussed yesterday. Can anyone recollect any of the themes from yesterday? Any point? A C T. So that is the overall overview session. We are going to discuss first is appreciate how the Lord is present and how the Lord is acting in our world. And C was connect. That's what we are going to discuss today. And then T was target. We want to target the Lord in the sense of making Him our ultimate goal of our life. Thank you. Anything else? Sorry? Fan. Okay. So when we want to appreciate, when we look at God or whatever ultimate reality, there are three options for us. That ultimate reality is, what is it? Favorable to us, against us, or neutral to us. Or is non-existent. Now, if that higher reality is against us, then we are doomed. Whatever we do, we are, our, our power is so tiny against that higher reality. So there's practically no point for living only. Now, if that is neutral, then we have to explore is it really neutral or is it favorable? So then we discussed about what is the next point? Major point of the class yesterday. One diagram. Different philosophies. Yes. Based on 4.10, we discussed the various philosophies. So what is this? What is the x-axis? Real. What is real? The yes, the material world, the world we live in is real. And then the other world or the spiritual world is real. So based on what is in the first quadrant? What is the philosophy called? Materialism. Yes, materialism. That is the prominent philosophy in this world that this world is real and whatever exists beyond is false. So this is the world view of desire or rag. So now the problem with this world view is that there is a death ultimately. A death takes us away. It takes whatever we are attached to away from us. Then when this happens, we discussed how in our life journey, we all have something that we consider to be Artha. And when this Artha is taken away from us, then we have a, either option, we go down toward what? Anartha. That we now the anartha is basically raga is the world view at the world things in this world we consider to be artha. So when we go toward anartha, that can be to the other two world views. And above what is what? Paramartha. So when something in this world is taken away from us, either we can just become frustrated and think everything is valueless, or we can look towards that which is of supreme value that it will last. So when we go toward Anartha, that may happen in these two worldviews. So second quadrant is what? Nihilism or voidism. Nirvishesha Shunyavadi. So neither this world is real nor the other world is real. This is the worldview of despair. Bita Radha, this is what? Krodha, yes. Anger. Life has no point to live at all. No. That thing is of any value. What is the point of living? So this is the worldview of despair. And then we have the other world is real, this world is false. This is the worldview of monism or nirvishesha. So nirvishesha means nothing special, everything is one. So this is the worldview of bhaya. Or we can call it dread. But everything in this world is just a trap. Whatever looks attractive is a deception to trap us in this world. So these two are the anartha, where we go towards bhaya or krodha. And then the fourth quadrant, what is it? Yes, it is the, it is the world view of bhakti. It is the world view of puta mat bhava magata. Bhava is the bhava, it is devotion. So we want to go towards this worldview. 
Now, significantly in this worldview, even the world we live in is considered real. It is not unreal, but it is it is temporal. And then we discussed any other point in other members? Sorry? Yes, okay, that's the that children all of your room. That's that. So when we talk about gratitude, we often think of the gifts what? In life. You know, I got this uh, I got this health, I got this job, I got this challenge, so many things. But the gift of life is much more fundamental. And that itself is not, it is not, although we consider it to be commonplace, but there are so many factors involved. So we discussed in the 15th chapter, the three levels, you can appreciate it. What are three levels? Cosmosis. At the level of the universe, at the cosmological level, then at the level of the earth, and then at the level of our own body. So the physiological level. So, at the level of if the sun were not existing, we would not exist. If the earth were not floating, the earth were not producing vegetation for us to eat, we wouldn't exist. If our body did not have the capacity to digest food, we would not exist. So, there are many things which make our very existence possible. That's why the gift of life is to be appreciated. And then, there was one more image which I said we'll come back to in each of the sessions. That is the image of spiritual advancement. So, in spiritual growth what happens? Initially, the world is big for us and Krishna is, God is small for us. But as we grow, what happens? The world becomes smaller and Krishna becomes bigger for us. So, now, I think we covered most of the things. Thank you. So let's move on. So the past time we are discussing here is so I'll we, we are discussing which past time does anyone remember? Puranjan past time. Yes. I went into so much philosophy that the past time I might have been forgotten. <laughs> but um, the point was it was a starting point for us to get into the discussion. So Puranjan. So I discussed about how Puranjan in his next life. He becomes Vidarbi. And then she is a devoted wife to her husband Malay Vajra. And Malay Vajra is a spiritualist who departs, who rules competently and then renounces the world. And then he departs in Samadhi. And while she is lamenting, at that time, the Lord comes to her. The Lord comes in what form? In the form of Brahmana. And he starts speaking to her, saying that, you know, we have been. We have known each other for a long time. So, does anyone have a mic separately? We have a second mic? Yeah, I can use. So, we can just read some of the translations over here. So, you can take the mic, whoever would like to read. Maybe one verse, one Prabhu can read, one of the other can read. So, yesterday, so let's read, read this particular verse. So, we discuss who are you? Whose wife or daughter are you? This is the verse we discussed. Let's look at the second verse now. Who would like to read? Yeah. The Brahman. the Brahman continued, My dear friend, even though you cannot immediately recognize me, can't you remember that in the past you had a very intimate friend? Unfortunately, you gave up my company and accepted a position as enjoyer of this material world. Yes, so basically, Api Smarasi Chatmanu. Don't you remember it? Smarasi. Avigyanta Sakham Sake. So, throughout this narrative, this particular character will be referred to as Avigyan Sakha. Avigyan Sakha is the unknown friend. So, you know, in our life, we have some friends whom we know. But sometimes you may see in some movies or some novels, you know, somebody gives an inheritance to some person. And they don't even know who gives their inheritance. Like you have some unknown benefactor. So you know, if we have some unknown benefactor, it would be such a big, big blessing for us. And sometimes we are trying to serve a temple and somebody is a donor. They don't, one thing is to not want their name to be known to public. 
But even they don't want even the temple to know who you are. It's something completely unknown. This is avijjanta sakha. So he says, Hitva maam padvam anvichyan. You turned away from me and you tried to enjoy this one. Bhauma bhoga ratogataha. Bhauma bhoga. That is earthly pleasure, material pleasures. So basically, the world becomes big for us because we desire to enjoy the world. We'll talk about that in later, but let's go ahead with the verses. Yes, good. Cool. My dear judge friend, both you and I are exactly like two swans. We fit together in the same heart, which is just like the ones are big. Although we have been living together for many thousands of years, we are still far away from our original home. Yes. So the Lord is speaking over here. Hamsa, hamchitong. And I and you, both of us are hamsas. Sakhayu, manasayu. So in the manas, right? It does, we are like trying to stay in this particular Abhutam antara avamka We have travelled for a long, long time Abhutam for a long time Sahasra parivatsara For hundreds of years It's been a long journey And normally if it's a long journey You may think, have I come close to my destination? But unfortunately in this journey We are going round and round It's a samsara chakra you know, If we go down the cycle Then we don't circle, we don't go closer just keep going up and down. So you say that we have been all a very long journey. Yes, who would like to read? My friend, you are now my very same friend. Since you left me, you have become more and more materialistic. And now seeing me, you have been traveling in different form throughout this material world, which was created by some woman. Mm. So now, Says, Sattvam Vihaya Maam Bando. You and we are the same friends. We are still together. Our relationship has not ended from my side. Sattvam Vihaya Maam Bando. Gato Gramya Mati Mahi. Gramya Mati is materialistic intelligence, materialistic consciousness. So with that consciousness, we are travelling. Vicharan Padam Adrakshi. So Vicharan, wandering around. And Kayachin Nirbitam Sriya. So here, it is in the particular story, if you know Puranjan's story is that Puranjan is wandering around as a king and then he comes to a palace and there is a beautiful queen over there and he marries her and he becomes the king. So similarly, here the Sriya refers to Maya Devi. Maya Devi is created in this world and you are trying to enjoy in this world. So the Lord is giving a broad outline of the nature of our present existence and our journey. And then the Lord will go towards describing this material world and the material body in uh, very vivid and the same way very functional terms. Who would like to read? Yes, please. In that city, the material body, there are five gardens, nine gates, and one protector, three apartments, six families, five stores. Five material elements and one woman who is born of the house. So now, if I have to explain this, I'll have to tell the whole, the whole class will have to be devoted to that. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't go into that right now. You can read the purport in the past tense. So this, this is basically describing that there's a lot, the key point over here is there's a lot already in this. See, when we come into the body, we, we often, I mean, our, in our mother's womb, the body is formed. But even the mother doesn't know how the body is being formed. So there is already a prototype based on which our body gets formed. So in this world, there is a lot going on and we are simply like visitors entering into this world. And specifically, into the body in this world, the body like a microcosm of the world at large. Now the idea is, there is some description further of these. Would like to read? Yes. Uh, my dear friend. The five gardens are the five objects of sense enjoyment, and the protector is the life air, which passes through the nine gates. The three apartments are the chief ingredients, fire, water, and earth. The six families are the aggregate total of the mind and five senses. Yes. So here, generally if you go into a city, you know, if it's a more traditional national city, the beautiful things, we have to see the parks and the gardens. The sense objects are the parts only. And then, in the previous narrative, it described that whenever our health goes down, it is the prana that is affected. 
Ayurveda talks about the very important role of prana. So prana is considered to be defender. The soul never dies, but even normally also when we look at the pulse of a person, we look at the breath of a person, the breathing stops, then we understand that life, that life has ended. So prana is considered to be the defender. Then of course there are nine gates, the, uh, the body is frequently called as the city of nine gates. Navadwari, Puredihi. And then there are the three apartments, although there are many building blocks, Umirapo, Nalovayu, but here the focus is on the more of the gross elements, earth, water and fire. Mm -hmm. Now these are often associated with cup of Vata and Vitta in some thought systems. And then, see, inside a city, there are some people who are active. Mm -hmm. So inside our body, ultimately soul is there, but primarily the mind and the senses that are active. Krishna says, Manaha Shashthani Indriyani Prakriti Sthani Prashanti. So most of us don't even know that our soul exists. What happens for us is, it is the mind and the senses that are active. So they are considered the family residing inside. Then, let's go ahead. The five stores are the five body sensory, sensory organs. They transact their business through the combined force of the five elements, which are better Behind all these activities is the soul. The soul is a person and an enjoyer in reality. However, because he is now hidden within the city of the body, he is devoid of knowledge. Yes. So, while all this is happening in the city of the body, there is the actual person that is meant to be the soul. But like right now, say, I am seeing you, I am knowing you, but I, the knower, am unknown to me. So it's almost like the knower is unknown. Each of us is the unknown knower of things. So the soul is hidden at the core of our being. And the core, although the soul, although it is a chit ananda, it is chit in the sense that it has the capacity for consciousness. It has consciousness. It has the capacity for cognition, for knowing. But right now, the knowledge is covered. Avrutam jnana metena. So we have very little awareness of who we are or what we are meant to do. Then, let's see. go ahead, go ahead, actually. My dear friend, when you enter such a body along with the woman of material desires, you become overly absorbed in sense enjoyment. Because of this, you have forgotten your spiritual life. Due to your material conceptions, you are blessed in various miserable conditions. Yes. So now here, the specific predicament why we are in a particular body is described. So Tasmin Swam, Ramaya is Krishna. Ramaya is that Rama refers to the goddess of fortune or of female. So this female represents the enjoying spirit that ultimately comes from Maya Devi. Because of that, we get caught in the body. It's like a child who is watching, say, a, a movie. Now, say the movie is a horror show. It's a horror movie. A child is perfectly safe at home. The mother is nearby, the father is in the next room. The child's consciousness is caught in the TV. And the child will be scared. The child may be alarmed. The child may scream, start trembling. And because the consciousness is caught over there. So, at one level, the whole arrangement, first of all, the TV set, and then what is broadcast on the TV set. All that is not created by the child. All that is created by someone else. So, but it's the child that is watching it. So, Purusha Prakriti Stodi. So, basically, within the system of illusion, there is a generic or a universal illusion, and there is a specific illusion. The generic illusion is, the overall illusion is that there is a TV set from which you can watch many things. The specific illusion is a specific TV show that the person is watching. So different people can watch different TV shows. So like that, when the soul becomes attached to the body, that's like the person getting glued to the TV set. The whole arrangement is made by material energy. But within that, based on our specific desires, we will decide what it is that we want to watch. And accordingly, that kind of illusion comes in. So, when you talk about the moha or illusion, 
So there is a general moha. The general moha is what? Basically, that which is temporary, we think to be long lasting, we almost think it to be eternal. That which is tiny, we start thinking it to be huge. The pleasure and the enjoyment, there's some pleasure, but we think it to be huge. We think that to be the goal of our life. Now the specific illusion, the specific illusion, it depends on our desires. So for some people, if you consider uh, how people get distracted, some people get distracted by cricket, some people get by politics, some people stock market, some people may get into romantic movies, some people may get into action movies. So, like, there are different kinds of illusions in the world. So like that, different people get caught by different things. So that's how, why in this world, what happens is, Daksham Papi Asim Prabhu. Your place in the Papi Asim Prabhupada translates that it is sinful activities, but essentially we may not think about sinful, the result is it see in terms of the suffering that we get in this world. So now let's just okay, I'll tell the translation, you'll read the translation and then we'll go back to the words. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Actually, you are not the daughter of Vidalpa, nor is this man a Malayatvaja, your well wishing husband. Now, were you the actual husband of Puranjali? You were simply captivated in this body of nine gates. Yes. So, Natam Vidarbha Suhita saying that whatever identity we have right now is interesting. It's talking of our identity also changes in life. Most of our identity is relational. When we are married to someone, then the husband of so-and-so or wife of so-and-so. When we have children, then our identity becomes like the parent of so-and-so, mother of so-and-so, daughter of so-and-so, son of so-and-so. Now when we are a student, we say, I am studying so-and-so degree. We get into a job, I am working in this company. So our identities keep changing. So in this verse itself, two identities from this life are talking about. And the daughter of so-and-so and the wife of so-and-so. And then one identity is talked from the previous life also. In the previous life, as Puranjan, the princess was Puranjani, when who see where we are born. You are not the Namna Patistha Puranjaya. Puranjaniya. So it's talking that all these identities that we have, these are all coming from the body and the situations that we have in the body. But they are, they are temporary. They are not necessarily false, they are temporary identities. And the mistake is not accepting the identity. The mistake is more than accepting it to be our essential identity or our main identity. It is a temporary identity that we have. Yes. Who is ready? Sometimes you think you said a man. Sometimes a chest woman and sometimes a liquor and energy. You look. This is all because of the body, which is created by the energy. This energy energy is my potency. And actually, both of us, you and I, are pure spiritual identity. Now, just try to understand this. I am trying to explain our actual position. Yes. Actually, when Prabhupada explains, he is actually bringing out his compassion. I am just trying to understand this. I am trying to explain our actual position. So, Hamsa, Pashya Vayor Gati. Pashya. Pashya is see. Pashya Avayor. Avayor is our Gati. This is our situation. This is where we are at right now. So, in one since yesterday I mentioned philosophy is help to make sense of things that don't make sense. So, we need to see things how they are actually. So, at this particular point, when that Anartha, when that Artha, what she had considered Artha is taken away from her, the Lord is coming to point her towards the Paramartha. So for all of us, while this is an incident that is described in allegorical form, long story, but the Lord is there in our hearts. And the Lord wants to talk with us. Generally, we often talk about these two words, prayer and meditation. So in one sense, they are related, at the same time they are also different. Mm -hmm. Now, prayer is when we talk to God. 
meditation is when we listen to God. So, in one sense, our mantra chanting is both a prayer and a meditation. On one side, we are uttering the mantra, so we are speaking. So that is, we are trying to talk with God. We are trying to offer our prayers. Prabhupada say that the mantra is chanted in the mood of Krishna, please engage me in your service. So, it's prayer. But at the same time, it is not the Lord is deliberately silent, making this presence and his will hidden to us intentionally. He wants to talk to us. But because we have turned away from him many, many times, now his voice is no longer audible to us. It's become there are so many other voices inside our head that the voice of the Lord is no longer heard. The Bhagavad Gita is not just a historical discussion. Yes, it is. Discussion with Krishna and Arjuna. But Prabhupada explained that our body is also like a chariot. And the super soul is present in the chariot of this body. And just as Krishna spoke to Arjuna and the Gita, similarly, the Lord wants to speak to us. And in fact, when we study Shastra regularly, so basically, just as Krishna spoke to Arjuna, in the chariot. So similarly, in our body, the super soul wants to speak with us, the soul. So this is this is not just a historical dialogue. It's what is meant. Whatever we hear in history, it's meant to inspire that talk within our hearts. And Krishna, as we practice bhakti more and more, Krishna becomes a living, loving reality for us. We say God becomes bigger, God talks with us. Just understand the factual situation. So understand that we have so many things which consider this is important, that is important. And then what is really important in the process, we may neglect that. So by studying Shastra, what is meant to happen? So here, slowly this Brahmana is is guiding, advising, and earning the trust of this uh, widow. And as he's doing that, then it is described that she will become enlightened. So, as yesterday, our spiritual growth in one way of God becoming bigger. Now, spiritual growth can also be understood in two different ways. See, there is, you know, there is faith, and then there is surrender. Now, faith essentially means we understand God is on my side. Yesterday I talked about faith is God, the FA and acronym. So through faith, we start perceiving that God is on my side. And surrender means I will be on God's side. Hmm? That God is on my side and I will be on God's side. I choose to be on God's side. So this is the essence of this dynamic relationship. I will be means I choose to be. So it is a choice that I make. So when Arjuna is facing the battlefield, it's a terrible situation for him. There's no fight against Bhishma and Drona. And this is his grandfather and his teacher. Now these are the people for whose pleasure he learned archery. Generally, see, we all even no matter how old we grow, there is a child inside us. And that child wants the approval, the appreciation, the of our elders, who we may consider it could be our parents, our guides. So you know, when we achieve something, it's just like the world praising us, world glorifying us one day. But there are some people who we respect and love very much. And their appreciation counts a lot. So, for Arjuna, he had learned his archery so that he could please Drona, he could please Bhishma. And now he had to fight against them. It was a nightmare situation to be in. And yet, by hearing the Bhagavad Gita, he understood that Krishna had a, has a plan. And this is not just some misfortune that this war is happening. Through this, all that is happening, Krishna has a plan. 
And Krishna wants my good, Krishna wants the demon's good. So, generally, Sai Shastra, it is not just to hear some nice stories. It's good to hear those stories. But through those stories, the shraddha that we are meant to get is, Krishna is on my side. That Krishna is for me. Krishna wants my best. Surudam Sarvabhutana. And then, but as that faith becomes stronger, then that will inspire us to surrender. So while these are a stepwise process, they are also cyclic. Faith inspires surrender, and as we start coming on the side of the Lord, we start seeing how things start falling in place. And then that increases our faith. So both of these go forward. So here, is we hear what the, is is what uh, the bees be told is that the that Avijan Sakha is here with you now. So the Lord is with us and the Lord is for us. So with this background we'll look at the remaining verses in our tomorrow session. But let's move forward now. So we talk about appreciate and now how do we connect with the Lord? What does it mean? So yesterday I talked about the gifts of life and gifts in life. See, generally, how does a child appreciate the love of the parents? Now, every child, you could say, has certain needs and has certain desires. Hmm? So, now the child may need food. But the child may not value the food very much. The child may value some toys, or the child may value some chocolate, or some sweet rice. They may not necessarily to choose food. So what happens is that the child will see the love of the parents in terms of the fulfillment of the desires, not in terms of the fulfillment of the needs. So, but what happens is, as the child starts growing, then the child starts appreciating that even if my this desire or that desire is not fulfilled, that what happens is my needs are being fulfilled. So we could call it desires or wants. So basically, in one sense, the process of growth in normal life is that initially we consider desires more important than needs. But as we grow older, we start valuing the needs more than the desires. Hmm? But that doesn't mean we give up our desires. We understand desires are important. But when our needs are taken care of, we appreciate that more. So just as this is the journey of normal growth, similarly, in the journey of spiritual growth, what happens is, for us, there are material gifts, and there are spiritual gifts. So initially, we value the material gifts far more than any spiritual gifts. If our health is good, we get a good job, we have nice salary, we have good salary, all those things we value more. And Krishna doesn't uh, reject or condemn that. Krishna in the seventh chapter he says, Chatur Vidha Bajante Maam Janaha. Sukruti no Arjuna. He said, all of these are Sukruti because they are coming to me. Now, as we grow spiritually, what will happen is we'll start appreciating spiritual things more than material things. Yeah. So this is a journey of spiritual growth. So now, when we get material things in our life, we need to be able to see the hand of God. Hmm? So, and gradually to connect with Krishna, like how does the child connect with the parent? The child connects with the parent because the parents take care of the child. Parents love the child. And the love is seen in various ways. So for us, in how we uh, see the hand of Krishna in our lives. So, I talk about three steps over here, by which how we can move forward. The first is appreciate. Appreciate means that, this is more as what I talked about yesterday, but it is that 
the many things that we have in our life. Often, we don't see God's blessings in our life because our mind, in everyone's life, there will be what we have and what we don't have. No matter how much we get, these two things are always going to be there. Even if we get a big house, from a house we get a mansion, but there will always be someone who has a bigger mansion than what we have. There will always be what we have and what we don't have. Now, if many times people think that I will become happy when what I don't have moves into the category of what I have. And yet there is something, there is some truth to that. There are some things which we need in our life, we get them, it will bring some happiness. But the problem is, if our mind is locked into looking at what we don't have, then we will never be happy. So that's why happiness, <clears throat> that's why our satisfaction, which is there, it is not just an emotion. Satisfaction is a decision. I feel satisfied. That's true. We are sometimes do feel satisfied. It is an emotion, but it is much more a decision. That decision comes by appreciating what we have. So suppose after this program there is Prashad. Bro, suppose Prashad is there. <laughs> but suppose there is some, some peculiar system over here that everybody will have a sweet. But everybody will have a different sweet. So say, you have a barfi, you have a peda, I have a laddu, you have a gulab jamun, you have a malpoa, you have a sandesh. Everybody has a different sweet. Now, I might be having a delicious sweet, but if I am looking at what you have and what she has and what he has, then I might be having sandesh and it will taste like sand too. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> because I'm not looking at what I have. So the first thing is we appreciate it. That if we are to ever see God's hand in our life, yes, yesterday I was talking about appreciate, but it was talking more about the gift of life itself. So in our life also we have many gifts. Apart from the gift of life, there are gifts in life also we have. So to some extent we start appreciating the gifts. Consciously look at the gifts that And uh, modern psychologists also talk about writing something like a gratitude journal to remind ourselves what are the good things in my life. Now, once we start appreciating, this this can itself help us see that there are so many things that are there in my life and they are not just there because I work hard for it. There are so many other factors that have to fall in place for them to come about. And still, after this, also, if one of the problems that comes up is we may appreciate what we have, but there are times when we feel that we don't get what we deserve. We may work very hard, we are uh, in school, we work very hard. And we were given an exam and we get far less marks than what we thought it is. We work in a project and we work very hard and then somebody else comes and takes a credit for the project. And it is when such things happen, it can be, it can be very infuriating. Now, why is this happening? You see, it's that, see, there is uh, life, there, are, there is unequality. There is inequality in life. They are unequal. Some people have more wealth than others. Some people have more better looks than others. That une things being unequal, in one sense, that upsets us. But what upsets us more is that that things are unfair. Now we can say unequal itself is unfair. But beyond that, okay, there may be some inequality. But why is it that I put in so much effort and I get so little? So, this is what often leads people 
or to have or to start questioning the world and questioning God. That being one of the biggest questions in theology, in the theology and study of God is why do bad things happen to people? And it is a question which does not have an easy answer. Sometimes you might just use karma as a magic wand, but it's not that simple. And as I explained, how it explains and to what extent, you know, we also have to have some humility about understanding how things happen. But broadly, what happens for us many times is that if we consider that if I put in work worth 100 and I get result worth 10, then it feels very unfair. Like, there are some people for whom we do 100 things and they barely notice all the things that you are doing for them and for one small thing they will give a little grudging appreciation. So I think, why is this person like this? Why am I doing this? Why am I even here? Why is this person doing so unfair? <laughs> now, it is true that such things will happen. At the same time, if we are honest with ourselves, we will find that there are also times when we put in effort worth 10 and we get a result worth 100. Say so we may find that we study a little bit for the exam and what we study comes in the exam and we get great marks. Or sometimes it happens that there is a we join a particular team for a project and we join the team when the project is nearing the completion and the project does very well and we get the credit for it. In India won the cricket uh, 50 was World Cup in 2011. So now in that World Cup winning team, there's one player who did play a single match and yet he was there in the World Cup winning team. So, you know, if you look at our lives, yes, there are times when we get less than what we deserve. But there are also times when we get more than what we deserve. Now, there are times when we find alive. somebody might just be very kind to us. Maybe in school, we might remember a teacher who was very harsh and demanding. But maybe some teacher was kind to us. Uh, he or she went out of the way to help us. We all can think of such people like this. So, we can say, even if life seems to be unfair, in the long run, it is fairly unfair. <laughs> <laughs> fairly unfair means that, that in the long run, things even out. That is not to say that terrible things won't happen in some people. For some people, there are more terrible things than others. That is true. But overall, things do even up. Now, most of you all know I need, I have, I need crutches for walking. I got polio. I got polio when I was one. My, mo my mother took me to a, a clinic for getting a polio vaccine. And somehow it was in a small town in Maharashtra. And there the fridge in which they had kept the polio vaccine, the power supply had gone on for that night. And because of that, the vaccine, the polio, multiplied over there. Not the vaccine, the, the germs multiplied over there. And the vaccine ended up giving me polio. So I was just walking along, one day I just fell down and I couldn't walk anymore on here. Now I don't remember any of this. But my first memory is probably I was two and a half or three or something. And some distant relative had come to our home. And she was consoling my mother, saying, you're so sad, your son got polio. And I remember my mother speaking a very calm, very clear, confident voice. Whatever he lacks physically, God will provide him intelligence. Now, I had no idea why my mother said that. And my mother passed away soon after, so I didn't get to ask her. But somehow that stayed with me. And then as I started going to school, as I started studying, you know, I couldn't play outdoor games like most kids. But I but I could notice that when I started studying, I could understand things very quickly. I could remember them much more than others. I could articulate things much better. So somehow it settled in the back of my mind that, but yeah, that I can say I didn't deserve anything to have polio in one day. But I didn't deserve anything to have an IQ better than others. So it is. Uh, it is not an anyway philosophy of karma at that time. 
But the point is that life, when we look at the way things work, there will be times when we get less than what we deserve. But there will also be times when we get more than what we deserve. So we, if we look at the bigger picture, so normally we say, if I am polite to you, I will expect that you should be polite to me. But if I am polite to you and you are rude to me, now I have two options. Either I think you are a crazy person, or I think maybe I have been rude to you in the past and I have forgotten but you are not forgotten. Maybe there is something more going on. Maybe it might not be I might have been rude. Maybe I belong to a particular community and somebody from my community hurt you in the past. And that resentment, that anger, that now you are taking it out on me. So basically, when things don't make sense, at that time, either we can come to the conclusion that things don't make any sense at all, or we can come to the conclusion there must be something bigger going on. There was something going on that I am not aware of, because of which this is happening. So essentially, what happens is when we are getting, say this particular thing is happening for us, we could say that at this particular time, there is something coming to us from behind. So there is some negative karma coming from the past. And because of that negative karma, our present positive karma is getting minimized. That's why we put an effort of 100, but we get a result only of 10. On the other hand, okay, what is happening is, here some positive karma from the past is coming in. And that's why we put a little effort and we get a lot of results. So many times, the philosophy of karma, so it is the emphasis is given on judgment. You know, whatever you do, you will be held accountable for that. Hmm? Whatever you are suffering, it's your own karma. Now, that is one aspect undoubtedly. But that is not the emphasis of karma. See, Krishna, when Arjuna has to fight against Bhishma and Drona, although Krishna is God, Krishna doesn't go into any esoteric previous life story, telling Arjuna, you were so and so in this life, and Bhishma was so and so, and Bhishma did that in that life, and you did that in that life, and because of that you have to fight Krishna. Krishna doesn't go into any special revelations like that. If you focus on karma primarily as a system of justice, then it raises many questions. That if I am punished for something, that at least I should be told what was wrong that I did. But we don't know that. So, thinking of karma, as a focus on judgment. That is that is true, but that is not the primary focus of karma. But this may be there, the essential focus of karma is encouragement. How encouragement? What the karma philosophy assures us is our actions matter. Even when they don't seem to. That I am treating this person well right now, but I am being kind and polite with this person, but still this person is being rude to me. So I can come to the conclusion, what is the use of being kind and polite? But no, my kindness and politeness, it matters. So sometimes we may do a karma and we may not get the fun. But that doesn't mean doing the karma, doing the good karma is useless. It just means that something from the past, is affecting us right now because of which we are not getting the results. But the past negative phase of karma will not last forever. It will end in time. So, A, now basically, when we see that if I do good and I get bad, so there is good action and there is a bad result. Now basically, there are broadly two options for me. We can go to two extremes of pendulum. One extreme is to say that there is no cause effect at all in the world. That's 
life is all chaotic and disorderly and there is no meaning. So sometimes if an atheist asks one of the strongest questions by atheists is why do bad things happen to good people? So mostly religious people try to defend and explain that. But sometimes offense is the best defense. They say, why should bad things not happen to good people? What do you mean? Bad things should happen to good things should happen to good people, bad things to bad people. So who said that? If there is no God, if there is no organizing principle, which is the foundation of atheism, then what, on what basis can you say that good things should happen to good people? Isn't it? Life will have no ordering principle at all. So we can conclude that there is no cause effect at all. And this is not the way anyone functions. Even atheists, this is not a criticism of atheists, there are many reasons why people become atheists. And more often than not, atheism is not philosophical as it is psychological. People have had bad experiences with religion, and, or with religious people primarily. And then they turn towards atheism. Now I was in Texas, and I was going for a program. Texas is known for being very aggressively, not Texas in general, but in general, the southern part of America is quite evangelical Christian. So they push people a lot to take Bible and believe in Jesus. So I saw a quote on a bumper, car bumper. It said, Oh God, please save me from your preachers. <laughs> <laughs> so, now the idea normally is that God saves us through his preachers. But here, oh God, please save me from your preachers. I don't want to make with that with these people. So, the point is, yeah, this is not a condemnation of atheists first. But it is by pointing out the illogicality of atheism. So, nobody lives with the idea that there is no cause and connection at all. Because, when atheists are not going to tell their children, you know, even if you study, you don't study, you know, the world is a lot of place. It doesn't make any difference. No, you study. And, sometimes life just doesn't make sense. So atheism does not remove the problems of life. The problems are there for everyone. Bad things happen to everyone in life. Atheism only removes the hope that So atheism, what it does is removes life's problems. Does it do that? Now, no philosophy is going to remove life's problems. Life's problems are going to there for atheists, whatever we have. What it does is, it cannot remove, what it does is, it removes the hope that life's problems have some purpose. They have some meaning. That Okay, why is this happening to me? There must there is some sense, there is some plan. So this all that atheism does is just remove that hope for us. So basically, when we face life's unfairness, the one extreme is to say there is no cause effect at all. The other is to say that the universe, or whatever you want to say, or God is against me. And then going back to our acronym, this is this is neutral, it's just all chaotic. It just things happen randomly or is against. Mm -hmm. So that now this is where the whole universe is meaningless, or the universe is against me. I am being singled out for something. Now when the first is bad, the second is worse. To think that you know somebody out there is out to get me, and whatever I do. Somebody is out there to thwart it, to destroy it. It's a very dark way to live. Now, in between, what we understand is something bigger is going on. It is not that there is no cause and effect, but there is something bigger going on. That right now, maybe I am going through a negative phase. Mm -hmm. Maybe I am going through a negative phase right now, which will end with time. Which will, the thing in this world lasts forever. 
Sometimes we may have a negative karma phase. And at that time, we just have to live with it. But no negative karma phase lasts forever. So, as we talk about the acronym ARC, so A was appreciate the gifts that are there. And T is persist. Persist when we are going through a negative phase of karma. Sometimes it may appear as if I am doing good and nothing good is happening in my life. But that doesn't mean I should stop doing good. In that, there is, God is in charge and there is a plan for life. But, now this persist, how can we do this? Now, I said for each session, I'll have one diagram. So this is the diagram for today. And uh, it's like in our situation, say our there is our present karma, that means what we are doing right now, and there is the past karma what we have done in the past. Now our present karma can be positive, our past karma can be positive. Our present karma can be negative, our past karma can be negative. So now this is the best situation to be in. If our present karma is positive and our past karma is positive. That means what? I am doing good things right now and from the past good things are coming to me. Then what will happen is, we we will be happy and we will be able to do good things also in our life. It's the best situation to be. Now, uh, let's look at these various situations. Now, if our past karma is negative, or uh, let's try to understand this dynamic before with the example. Say, suppose there's a city in which in a bank uh, a lot of cash is brought. Maybe 10 million dollars are brought into cash. Uh, in cash in the bank. And then 10 thieves come to know, oh, there is this cash over here. And they come to know, they all plan to rob. Now, all 10 of them plan to rob the bank, but various things go wrong, and 9 of them fail. And one of them succeeds. Now, why did this one person succeed, and everyone else fail? It was, because this one person had some good karma in the past. <laughs> you know, it requires good karma to do bad karma. <laughs> but to do bad karma means to be successful in what we do. See, in general, if we are honest in our lives, we understand that success requires factors beyond our control to fall in place. Like you consider cricket or any sports. You know, the players have to perform well, but so many other things have to all in place for victory to come about. So, our present karma, it has to be important, but then the past karma has to fall in place. So the thieves, now the, the thief who succeeds in robbing the bank. Now, if that thief had instead developed the skills and developed the aptitude to do some project, to do some work, by the past karma, that thief would have been successful in that house. So basically, because of past karma, success was going to come. But by the present karma, the person decided what I want to do, is it going to be good or bad? <laughs> so basically, the results that we get in our life, so in general, I give the example of 100 plus 5. But most often, for what happens for us is, that whenever we get any fuller, that fuller, that is present, karma and there is past karma and both combine together to give the result. Now sometimes it can range from the past karma to be 100 and the present may be zero practically. Like say somebody is not only born in a wealthy family but somebody is born in a healthy family with great looks and with a great IQ. It's almost like they just get propelled towards success. It's never 100 to 0. You could say it's 99 to 1. They have to put in, uh, they have to do some, they have to do some good work. Now the other extreme could be, the past is only 1 and this life is 99. That means somebody is born in a very bad neighborhood, maybe they became orphan in their childhood, and they suffered various kinds of abuse. 
and still they worked hard, they got some scholarship, they did a job while studying, and then they rose to become successful. So this combination of how much past karma and how much present karma, we don't know how it is going to work. And this can also change during different phases of our life. Sometimes it may be that a lot of things fall in place for us. And sometimes, so that means present we have to very little and things work out. And sometimes a lot of things fall out of place. So we do a lot and still we get little result. But basically, life, the results that we get are a combination of present and past. So when results don't seem to be coming, it is not that God is unfair or God is non-existent. It is that something bigger is going on. Something from the past is affecting the results that are coming. So now, if we go back to this, with this understanding, let's go back to this quadrant. So, if the person has negative past karma and negative present karma. So, negative past karma means that person will be relatively powerless. Hmm? Uh, the, the person, because of positive, negative present karma, that person will be bad. They will want to do bad things. But because the past karma is not there, so the person will be bad, but will be very powerless. Like somebody decides, I, I'll become a criminal. And they join the underworld and they think, I'm going to become the next underworld dog. And the first robbery that they make, they are arrested and for the rest of life, they, like they go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> so, that person may want to do bad, but if the past karma is not good, they can't do much bad. Isn't it? Hmm? Now, <laughs> so now, if you see, if the past karma is positive and the present karma is negative, this is actually the most dangerous situation. A person is bad and the person is powerful. Hmm? So this is the most dangerous. This is where many tyrants, many dictators, many terrorists. So they. They have some past good karma because of which what they do will be successful. But right now they are doing some bad things. So now basically for us, if we understand that God is in control and there is an action result correlation, then basically we rule out this whole quadrant. I am not going to do any negative karma in the present. So here, see, if we are in the, so if we call it one, two, three, four, the so three is the worst, four is the best. But if, okay, nothing has come. Okay, it's gone down. Okay, it's interesting that screen is smaller than this screen. Okay, no problem. So, so if we are this this quadrant. When we are doing some good things, but we are not getting good results. So this is where we need persistence. Persist. That because of some negative karma from the past, I am doing some good, but I am not getting the results. It's like a child may be behaving very nicely, but the parents withhold some privilege from the child. You say, no, I did my homework, I did this, I did this. But the parents will say, you were naughty in the past. You know, I did great. But big naughtiness, that's why you're not getting these privileges. The child may think, oh, I did this, you should give me this now. But there's something from the past coming up. So, this is the persistence. But Krishna says, karma ne vahadika araste, maha padigishim kadajin. But because our phala doesn't come only from our present actions. It comes from present plus past actions. Uh, so, but when we are going through this world, so the topic as I was discussing today was about connecting with the Lord. Connecting with the Lord, I'm not talking about bhakti right now. I'll be talking bhakti more tomorrow. See, for most people, as I said, like a child doesn't really understand the fundamental needs. Child looks at the desires. Am I getting them or not? Like that for most of us in this world, the material things that are happening in our life, they at a functional level matter much more. And if things are going wrong in that direction, in that area, it's very difficult to keep our faith steady. So we need to be able to make sense of this. 
Now the last part in the acronym, I'm not going to elaborate on this, I'm talking about APT. So, P is transient. Now transient means what? Our, we start valuing the spiritual more than the material. That, it's like a child starts understanding that the toys are not that important. That material things and material things and the ups and downs that happen with it, they are from the spiritual perspective ultimately, they are temporary. But we cannot come to this level immediately. It takes time to come to this level. So, and Krishna also doesn't expect us to come to this level. So with the karma philosophy, we understand if things are not working, that doesn't mean that God is against me. It just means I am going through some negative phase right. So, one way to persist is by just pushing on. But other way is, okay, all this is not that important. You know, it's like one, one essential mean of, the, of transcending, what does it mean? We start understanding that the thoughts inside are more important than the things outside. That, that the things outside are important. I want health, I want wealth, I want social respect and all these things. I want a good house, I want these things. But the thoughts inside are more important. So by the practice of bhakti, you know, bhakti what it will do is, it will improve the quality of our thoughts. Now will the quality of our things improve? That depends. Now, karma and bhakti can overlap in quite puzzling ways. When we start practicing bhakti, we start chanting Hare Krishna, we start remembering Krishna, then that remembrance starts elevating the level of our thoughts. And that elevation of the level of thoughts starts giving us satisfaction internally. So the material things start mattering less for us. Right? That's how whether we are going through good karma phase or bad karma phase. Our connection with Krishna keeps us satisfied. Bhakti Thakur says in so many songs, Sukhe Dako Vani, Dukhe Dako, Sukhe Dukhe, or Gre Dako Vani Dako. Sampatti Vipatti. These dualities, a devotee becomes steady in them because the connection with Krishna helps us realize the state of things in the outer world matters. But the state of thoughts in my inner world matters even more. And Krishna is always there for us to remember. And if you remember him, he enriches our thoughts. And by that enrichment of our thoughts, the external, whether there is enrichment or lack of enrichment, that doesn't matter so much. So Krishna is there within our hearts, calling us. He wants to give us the, the higher vision by which when things are going wrong, it is not that Krishna has abandoned us. It is that Krishna is with us, but it is he wants us to abandon the illusions that make us think that he is he has abandoned us, that we, it is we who have gone away from him. So this transcending, how we can do that, that is, we target Krishna as the Lord of our life, that will be discussed in our last session tomorrow. I'll summarize what we discussed today. We discussed broadly the past time, we read through various sections and how the Avikyan Sakha is guiding the saying that we have been together for a long time. Now we are caught in this body and the illusion. But we are still far away from home. Just turn towards me now. So how do we turn? Today we are focused on like how to connect with the Lord. We are discussing the acronym ACP. So now we, I, yesterday I talked about appreciating the role of the Lord in terms of the gift of life. But today I talked about A, it was A, P, T. T I didn't focus on, A was what I focused on. A, A was what here? Appreciate in terms of the gifts in life. Gifts in life is that for all of us, there will always be things we have and things we don't have. What we have and what we don't have. So appreciate means that if our vision 
is locked on to what we don't have, we can never be happy. So what we want to do is turn our vision over here. That is what will help us to be happy. So appreciate what we have, cultivate gratitude. But still, it may feel that life is unfair and that's where the major part of the session was on persist. So, why do we need to persist? Because normally we may say karma means I do action and I get a result. And it is true at certain level that if I eat cold food, I may get a cold. So action result correlation is there. But when it doesn't seem to be there, then at that time, if I'm doing a large action, I'm getting a tiny result. Then what does it mean? Is there is something negative coming from the past. So 110, so minus. So <coughs> the point of karma is not so much judgment. You did wrong and you will punish for that. It's more of encouragement. That what you are doing, even if the results are not coming, that doesn't mean that life is pointless. It just means that we are going through a negative phase right now. In this connection, we discussed that diagram over here, the pendulum, two diagrams. One was the pendulum. When we do good and we get bad. Either we can say that all life is meaningless, or the life is against me. Now, both of these are really not hope giving doctrines. So instead what we see there is a bigger picture. Bigger picture means there is something from the past coming in. So if our present karma and the past karma that we are doing, <laughs> so we would like to avoid the whole case where there is a present karma is negative. So this is, if both of them are negative then what happens? The person is bad but the person is relatively powerless. They can't cause, cause much harm. The past karma is good, and the present karma is not, they are bad and powerful. This is a deadly situation to be in. Now, if this is the best, our present karma is good, past karma is good, then this is the best. But if this is not the case, then there is need to be persistent. That this dark phase will end. And then finally we talked about transcend. I mentioned this briefly. Transcend means what happens is we start seeing that material things, you know, they are not that important. They will come and they will go. This not that important means we discuss the idea of growth. For a child growth, what happens is initially the child considers desires to be more important than needs. When the child grows, child starts to understand that needs are more important than desires. So like that, initially we think material things will be very important. But as we start transcending, material things are not that important. So understand what is more important is the thoughts inside us. And bhakti, practice, connection with Krishna can elevate our thoughts. It can enrich our thoughts. And thus we can be satisfied that Krishna is with me and I want to be with Krishna. So in this connecting, I talk about faith and surrender. Faith is Krishna is on my side. And surrender means I will be on Krishna's side. So for us, you know, we cannot really chant and practice sadhu sadhana very consistently if at the background we are feeling that God is against me or God doesn't care for me. So we need some amount of Shastra Chakshi. Some people will say, oh, some people just have innocent devotion. They don't need philosophy. Yes, then some people can have its innocent natural devotion. But even for such people, when bad things happen, if some philosophical perspective can help them to make sense of what is happening, then they can fix their mind on Krishna more easily. So that faith, here what we're talking about is the faith that comes from a philosophical perspective. I don't think Krishna is on my side. Let me be on Krishna's side. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? 
is sometimes not very helpful. We differentiate, there is a value in the differentiation. I am simply talking about material and spiritual in terms of, sorry, positive and negative karma in terms of you know, the action that will lead to some good and the action that will lead to some bad. So when I am talking about positive karma also, now positive karma can be in an ethical sense. That you know, we understand that say eating meat, eating meat or killing animals is and, and, and bad. But when I am talking about positive karma, I am also talking about it in a functional sense. Functional sense means what? Say somebody is rude to me and I choose to be rude to them. It's unlikely that that is going to make things better. Functional sense, I am polite. Now, is that all that is required? Sometimes you have to stand up for ourselves. Sometimes you know, we can't just be polite without being appear to be foremost. So, positive karma means what will make things better. That's that with our present understanding of things, we have to learn what will make things better, and we do that. Now, do we always know what will make things better? Certainly not. But is it that we never know what will make things better? No, that's also not true. There are always some small steps we can take. So, so in that sense, persistence is that broadly, again going back to this diagram, in broad patterns we know what is going to make things worse and what is going to make things better. So we try to keep doing the things that will make things better. When Abhimanyu is killed, at that time Arjuna is shattered. And Arjuna is lashing out at Yudhishthira and Bhima especially saying, Are all your weapons just ornaments? Could not one of you protect my son? They are already feeling terrible. Arjuna's words are like whiplashes on their face. At that time Krishna pulls Arjuna into a side hall. Krishna says, O Partha, in this world bad things happen to you. The wise and the unwise. The difference between the two is that when bad things happen, the wise act in ways that make things better. Whereas the unwise act in ways that make things worse. So, O Partha, your brothers are in pain at the death of Abhimanyu, just as you are. Please don't speak words that will increase their pain. Please don't speak what increase that pain. So Krishna is not going to elaborate philosophy about or some again past life karma was of the menu and why did this happen to him. But Krishna focused on is you know, this situation has come now. Now in fighting among the Pandavas, blaming each other, it's only going to make things worse. So now what can we do? We have a war to fight, let's fight it with more people. So in that sense, I'm talking, Krishna was talking in a functional sense of it. Now, karma does definitely have an ethical dimension, but karma also has like a practical, functional dimension. So, in our situation, what can I do to make things better? So, ultimately, when we talk about service attitude, seva bhav, uh, service attitude can be at one level, serve Krishna, we can say. That is true, but what does serve Krishna mean? If Krishna is Surudam Sarva Bhutanam, Krishna is the Ranvishwara of everyone. That means Krishna wants things to be better. Krishna wants us to be better. Krishna wants things to be better. So when you say service attitude, in one sense you can call it this. Service attitude can also mean what can I do to make things better. So how can I serve Krishna? That is one meaning of service attitude. How can I serve Krishna? But what can I do to make things better? That is the same principle of service attitude applied in a broader way, in a more relevant or practical way for us. That same concept, if you consider a pendulum, like not a pendulum, like a funnel, you broaden it. At one level it means, how can I serve Krishna? But Krishna is not just in the temple, not in the altar. Krishna is in the world. Krishna wants, like Krishna tells Arjuna, you become an instrument for me in the fight. So Krishna wants to fix things in the world. 
No. They are under the big Dharma Yuddha and Krishna himself had come. So we may say, I am not fighting a Dharma Yuddha. But whatever it is, we can make the, the situation of our life more orderly or more disorderly. So we take Dharma in the broad sense of order. Then serving Krishna means how can I act to make things better in this situation? Any other Mataji, any questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for the helpful time. My question is like um, a little bit around the philosophy because yesterday also you mentioned a lot about philosophy and mm -hmm. today also let me talk about it. But sometimes what happens when you read a lot, like in case, like I, I read a lot about philosophy, Western philosophy, different, different philosophy, but then, then what happens? There are so many questions that actually comes in your mind. And sometimes you get the answer, sometimes you don't get it. In that, in that scenario, like, um, like how to handle this situation practically? Yeah, that's a good point. See, <clears throat> when we study philosophy, there can be two purposes broadly for studying philosophy. One is, we want certainty. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is like this, this is like this, this is like this. Mm -hmm. But the search for pure, the study of philosophy can also be due to curiosity. See, in our tradition, Athato Brahma Jitnyasa. So we as human beings will never have certainty. There is a lot that we will not know. Krishna himself says Gana Karmano Gati that when someone is suffering, what exactly is the cause of the suffering? When Arjuna has to fight against Dona and Bhishma, what is the cause of that? Krishna says Gana Karmano Gati. There are no pat answers to the, to the sufferings in this world. So if you want certainty, no philosophy is going to give us certainty. Hmm? That's not a problem of the philosophy, it's a problem of the human condition. We are finite beings and we live in a very vast world. So, if we have curiosity, then through curiosity, what we can get is clarity. And the clarity can keep increasing. But the clarity will never lead to certainty. So, just because we don't get answers to all questions, does not mean that we shouldn't study philosophy. We seek answers as much as we can. The 10.9 the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, even the enlightened keep enlightening each other. Aham sarva se prabhu bhakta sarva prabhati te itam iti matva vajante ma buddha bhava samanvita. Krishna says, these are enlightened, they are devoted to me. But the buddha is enlightened. But the next verse says, this is the enlightened people, what do they do? Bodhayanta parasparu. They keep enlightening each other. Because reality is endlessly complex. And we keep learning. So, if we have a philosophical inclination, then we should try to associate like-minded devotees who also have philosophical inclination. And they will appreciate our questions, they will give us some insights. If, people are, if we are philosophical and the people around us are not very philosophical, then they will not appreciate our questions very much. They just find it intellectually irritating or whatever. So we need like-minded association. But yes, we should. Just because philosophy can't answer everything, doesn't mean that philosophy should not be studied. This means that there is a human search for understanding that is ongoing and you can keep learning more and more. Yes, so take two questions. You have a question? Yeah. Yes, Ramsun, one question. Uh, we discuss about the persistence and transcendence. So, like uh, certain times when the uh, times are very trying, uh, persistence uh, takes a beating. And it takes up. Takes a beating in the sense that we are, we are, the, it becomes shaky, the persistence. And uh, we also discuss about transcending thing. So sometimes we may make this as an excuse, oh, this is not for me, better to transcend. So is it a trap uh, that, uh, that keeps us away from our persistence? I, I think I'll have to discuss this more elaborately tomorrow. But persisting does not necessarily mean doing the same thing again and again. Mm -hmm. Persisting means we try to do the right thing. But what is the right thing 
can vary from person to from time, place, circumstance. The difficult are the Pandavas. The Pandavas always try to follow dharma. But in general, when we are having difficulties, broadly there are three options for us. There is we can mitigate the difficulty. You know, when we I use the acronym met for this. When we have met a wise person, we have met wisdom, then we mitigate the problem, we emigrate from the problem, or we tolerate the problem. Hmm? Now these three broad options are there. And say we look at the Pandavas when Bhima was poisoned. Hmm? They tolerated it. You just said, don't make it a big issue. I mean, Bhima is just a bit insecure. That's why I did something like this. Now, when there was the fire in the house of Lack, in the palace of Lack, what did they do? They didn't go back to confront the Pandava, from the Kauravas. They emigrated. But eventually, when both Draupadi, first Draupadi was dishonored, and then Krishna was dishonored. They attempted, attempted, they attempted to arrest Krishna. Then they decided we have to fight a war. So the right thing is not necessarily the same thing. So when we say persist, persist in doing the right thing doesn't mean the same thing. In different situations, different things are the right thing. So we always persist. We have to use our buddhi to determine how to persist. So when I talk about persistence, it's more persist is is more in the principle that I will do the right thing. Hmm? But in terms of practice, what is the right thing? That, that we may have to decide. Well, that, that is not the same thing all the time. If we are working in a job and say repeatedly we are doing the job and we are not getting credit for what we do. Somebody else is feeling the credit. Then you may decide, okay, I don't, uh, right now it's a new job, I have to at least get some experience, I have to tolerate it. Mm. But if it's happening again and again, we get some, we have some experience, we have some credibility. Then we may try to raise the issue, escalate it, complain about it, or uh, try to mitigate the issue. And if the mitigate doesn't work, then we decide, I don't want to make this job, I'll get a better job and I'll recognize what I'm doing. So I make it. So all three options are there. So the right. So now, all these three. I'm talking about all these three as all these three could be done in a service attitude, but all these three could be done in a negative attitude also. The opposite of this could be retaliate. The Pandavas did not fight the Kurukshetra war to just take revenge against the Kauravas. Krishna said, "Fight without any." Animosity toward them. Nirvaira Sarvamurti. Emigrate could be running away. Hmm? You just face any problem, you run away from that place. That's not good. But the opposite of tolerate is to suffocate. In the name of tolerating, we are not able to do anything at all, and there's so much resentment inside us. We are just uh, completely frustrated inside. So, in modern psychological terms, we call it as fight. Flight, freeze. Hmm? So, doing the right thing is not very easy. But now, can transcending be an excuse? It's possible. But ideally, what we should do is we transcend in the sense of we turn towards Krishna, we pray to Krishna, we immerse ourselves in Krishna, and then we revisit the situation with that higher connection. Then, Krishna, what, what is the best thing for me to do? How can I act in this situation that will be constructive? We pray to Krishna. So, tomorrow our devotion has these two aspects. It's world transcending, but it is also world transforming. So, Maam Anusmara Yudhya We remember Krishna, that is we understand what is happening in this my life. It's not only because this person is a terrible person, or this company is terrible, this country is terrible, or I am terrible. That is just a material vision. And there is some truth to that, but that is not the complete reality. So, we want to transcend to get the bigger picture, connect with Krishna. 
But Krishna is in charge in this situation. Krishna has a plan going on and Krishna has a part for me in this plan. So that conviction we get by transcending. And then we see how I can go about transforming the situation. Okay? Yes, Ali, last question. Stop. We are talking about the um, past karma and present karma, the results like if negative past karma are there, how much we do, uh, the result might be the small. But in this case, the faith can be shaken right now. So like whatever good we are doing, the results are not coming. And some some people may give up on uh, yeah. the good things. So how how to convince uh, such things to the people who really don't understand this concept? It's difficult, it's not easy. Uh, the first thing is that you know, our attitude should not be trying to convince them that God is right and don't blame God. Our attitude should be we want to help them. As a attitude, as a part of helping them, we are offering this philosophical perspective. If people see that we are using their suffering as a means to thrust our philosophy down their throat, then they will not accept it. So, our goal should be that, yes, life is complicated. And sometimes we just go through difficult phases. Now, we have, ultimately we have to make one choice. That, is life meaningful or is life meaningless? Is there some order in life or is life completely disorderly and chaotic? So, if we accept this disorderly and chaotic, then that's the, that has certain consequences. That is psychologically quite damaging to live with. So, we all have some understanding that there is some order. So, then, so we offer that this is a resource by which you can make sense. You can, you can try to make sense when things are not making sense. So then, okay, we can try to help them look back at their own life when they went through a good phase. If we are alive, that itself means that there are more things right with us than wrong with us. But there are more things wrong, we will just fall dead in one minute. So yes, we might be going through a bad phase right now, but if you look at our life, surely every one of us can think of some phase in our life when we did get more than what we deserve. Let me say we got some lucky break. Like somebody say, I worked very hard and that's why I got this. That may be true. But I'd say somebody some student worked very hard and they got some scholarship. Now we may say, I worked hard, that's why I got a scholarship. But no, there was somebody who set up the scholarship. Isn't it? That is an act of kindness from that person. We may have studied by which you got qualification for scholarship, but qualification is not earning, isn't it? It's scholarship is not a salary. So that was a lucky break for us. So we need to guide them to see that this life is bad, but that life obviously bad. And then some amount of perspective comes. It's not easy. Especially when we are going through bad phase at that particular time. But if we can help them to see that basically, I mean, difficulties, we can either catastrophize. You know, catastrophe means that, oh, this is a natural earthquake, this is a tsunami, it's catastrophize. We can either catastrophize, everything is terrible, or we can contextualize. So catastrophizing leads to problems. Our mind works on the problem. Contextualize means, yes, in this phase, in this context, you see, this is terrible. It, it does seem unfair. But then, look at some other context in your life. Were things not better? It will be not that things more than what we deserve. So, if we can help them contextualize, then it is relatively easier for them to also see, to not lose, lose hope at that point. So thank you very much.
तंत्राज श्री भागवतन की श्री लभुपाल की गौर भक्त नंद की गौर भी